Excuse me. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Manns, and I'd like to welcome you to the April 4th Coalition Show. This is the a April 24th, 2023 edition of the show, and has been 450 shows that we have done since the closing of the North Adams Regional Hospital. The April 4th Coalition's mission statement is we are for workers' rights and collective bargaining rights and are against tax breaks for the rich and corporations who ship our jobs overseas. We support all the articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but as is our custom, we put the emphasis on Article 23, and as we have a guest with us this week, Rachel Branch is kind enough to come back as we're doing a topic that's near and dear to her. Oh, I think so. <laughs> so Thank you. Anyway, so one, two, three, back to Dick for number four. Okay. Number one, <clears throat> everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work and protection against unemployment. Number two, everyone without any discrimination has the right to equal pay for equal work. Number three, everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for herself and him or himself and his or her family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented, if necessary, by other means of social protection. Number four, everyone has the right to form and join trade unions for the protection of his or her interests. And thank you for taking number three. You say that long word much better than I do. <laughs> we, we should just change it to funds or pay. Pay. We, pay. Should, we should. We should. But, you know, uh, but Eleanor Roosevelt might get mad at us if we do that. We don't want to get her mad. We don't want no, to get her mad. A, um, yeah. We did promise the topic is mainly on something near, near to Rachel, but you found a letter in the Berkshire Eagle yes, that you wanted to read today? Well, I, I had gotten a call from a, a former union president of Western Mass um, for the uh, Letter Carriers Association, uh, John Weissman, and he's part of the, uh, the single-payer movement mm -hmm. in Massachusetts to create a Massachusetts single-payer. So I thought I'd read this letter from Dr. Mark Pettis in Dalton, in support of Medicare for All efforts. To the editor, as a former director of pop population health and community care for Berkshire Health Systems, I am writing in support of the Medicare for All legislation, Senate 766 and House 1267, and Massachusetts campaign for a single payer health care. I have been a physician educator in the Berkshires for 35 years. In that time, in, in diverse clinical leadership roles, I cared for many individuals and families confronted, confronting advanced chronic complex disease. I experienced the profound impact that social determinants of health like food and housing insecurity, trauma, health literacy, and addiction have on overall health and quality of life. Research from the Robert Wood Johnson would suggest social determinants of health as the primary driver of health behaviors and ultimately health outcomes, including cost of care. While the Berkshires clinical community integration and services haven't evolved to better address these needs, they are usually supported by grants and time-limited funding. We spend far more per capita and have poor health measures uh, compared to countries with similar GDP per capita. America is not in good health, and we spend trillions on deli a delivery system that is not designed to create health. The COVID pandemic further lifted the veil on how tenuous it is to tie health care insurance to employment. Even when insured, many people avoid essential health services due to fear of cost. We have seen the consequences of delaying essential care as one of many lessons learned from COVID. The Medical Care for All legislation, the Medicare for All legislation provides a timely and thoughtful solution, and Massachusetts could be the vanguard of healthcare transformation as it has for the last 200 years. The legislation would provide universal coverage without deductibles and co-pays a substantial amount of resources that maintain this administrative behemoth, behemoth could be allocated to better support community clinical integrative models of care 
that more effectively address the drivers of disease and the cost of care that continues to burden individuals and businesses around the Commonwealth. We do not need to spend more money on health care. We need to spend more wisely. There will be great opposition from industries that have benefited greatly from the current model of care. A Medicare for All system is both more efficient with its elimination of administrative burdens and equitable with the elimination of cost as a barrier to care. Our Berkshire legislation has co-sponsored and supported this legislation. The time has come to be bold and to make it happen. Dr. Mark Pettis mm -hmm. of Dalton. Good letter, but I, I think really it needs to go much farther on, on uh, mm -hmm. undoing the insurance mess glob. <laughs> right. That mess. That would, and, that would eliminate it. With a single yes, pair, we would. Wanna, it would eliminate it. I imagine when you think about it, the Medicare cost might go up a little bit, but it wouldn't be as much as what you're paying to have a supplemental health insurance, mm -hmm. dental, vision, hearing, you know, because I've just started going into the mess, as we call it, because I've just recently retired and I'm running into it and find, and I'm running into the thing of what I said to you guys years ago. It's wonderful to have insurance, but what do you do if your doctor doesn't take your insurance? Right. The, the, uh, it kills you. <laughs> on the whole, the United States pays for having single payer. We already spend that amount of money, but Correct. we just don't get it. Right, because not, even Medicare, even though it's single payer, is only gives you 80% coverage. Why is that 20% gap there? There's no reason for it and to be there. And why is there a deductible past that? I have a right. $236 and deductible on Medicare, and I can't afford a, I can't afford a supplemental. Yeah. It's not covering the $2,800 plus dollars I spend out of pocket every year mm -hmm. for the care that I need. Exactly. So, um, and so, and we all don't think of insurance as a driver into poverty, but it it does do it because it costs so much to carry it. Yes, if you're you get sick, you're glad you have it because it cuts down the cost. But ultimately, it's still driving everybody down into poverty because you have to spend so much just to keep it. And the yeah. CEOs and the administrative yeah. people are making a ton of money, and they should be nonprofits, and they have to balance right. and make break even and mm -hmm. um, and have a, a ratio have. between the lowest paid and the highest it's, paid that's reasonable. Yeah. You know. But anyways, that would help. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to to uh, we have a video by. Anman Poor and Company that's on PBS. Uh, um, and so why don't we show that video? I was reading of, of another uh, email that you sent me that, about health care from mm -hmm. her. But this is more on poverty, and it's, it's interviewing Matthew Desmond, who wrote a book um, about ending poverty. And it's all connected. Yeah. That's one of the things is connect the dots. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Climate disruption, of course, adds to global poverty. Our next guest believes that can be eradicated, but only by getting enough people to make the change. Despite being the richest country, the United States has a higher rate of poverty than any other advanced democracy. Pulitzer Prize winning author Matthew Desmond examines the dire situation in his new book, and he's joining Michelle Martin to explain why the problem persists. This conversation is part of our ongoing initiative about poverty, jobs, and economic opportunity in America called Chasing the Dream. Thanks, Christian. Professor Matthew Desmond, thank you so much for talking with us once again. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back. The last time we talked with you, we talked about your book, Evicted, a critically acclaimed, a bestseller. It, it, just as the title implies, it dug into the origins and the scope of the eviction phenomenon in the U.S. Now, your latest book, Poverty by America, kind of deals with similar ideas, but it feels different. I mean, in a way, it feels like a book that you've been kind of waiting to write your whole life. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's right. You know, I've been researching and reporting on poverty all of my adult life. I've lived in really poor neighborhoods. I've done into the dug into the statistics, but I, I just didn't feel like I had an answer to this really pressing question, which is why, why there's so much poverty in this incredibly rich country. And so this book is my response to that question. I think there's always been something about the American poverty debate that didn't sit well with me. And I remember reading a line by the novelist Tommy Orange where he writes, uh, these kids are jumping out of the windows of burning buildings, falling to their deaths. 
And we think that the problem is that they're jumping. Hmm. And when I read that, I was like, man, that sounds like the poverty debate. And we have been focused so much on the poor themselves. And we needed to be focusing on the fire. You know, who lit it? Who's warming their hands by it? So this is a book about the fire. This is a book about how some lives are made small so others may grow. You say that poverty is often material scarcity piled on chronic pain, piled on incarceration, piled on depression, piled on addiction, on and on it goes. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the people that you profile in the book and the way you say that poverty kind of isn't just one thing. It's a thing that piles on and folds in on itself. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when I was spending time in Milwaukee for my last book, I met grandmothers living without heat in Wisconsin, you know, sleeping under blankets all winter long, praying that the space heater didn't go out. I, I saw kids evicted all the time. Um, the courtroom in the eviction courtroom is just brimming over with, with children facing homelessness and eviction every day in that city and cities all across the country. You know, America harbors a hard bottom layer of poverty. And it's not just about a lack of money. It's about a lack of choice. It's about pain. It's about humiliation. It's about the nauseating fear of eviction. On and on it goes, which I think should spur us to moral action. You know, it could really drive us to address this problem because poverty isn't just a lack of income. It's this exhausting collection of social maladies and problems. Is it your argument that the United States is, is fairly unique in that among affluent nations? That, that you just don't find a peer economies in which the, the level of misery is what it is in the, in the United States. That's right. We really are in a class all our own when it comes to the level of poverty that we tolerate amongst all this wealth. There's no other advanced democracy that has the kind of poverty that we do and the depths of poverty that we have. And you know, while abroad, I've often heard Europeans use the phrase American style deprivation. You know, they can see it. Um, our child poverty rate is twice what it is in Germany or South Korea or Canada, for example. We are really lagging behind other advanced democracies when it comes to addressing poverty in our borders. Your point of view is that poverty persists in the way that it persists because the non-poor benefit from it. Why do you say that? Well, we often consume the cheap goods and services that the working poor produce. Now, those of us invested in the stock market like healthy returns, even though those returns often come at the cost of a human sacrifice uh, with poorly paid labor. A lot of us really protect our tax breaks, like our mortgage interest deduction. But those tax breaks really accrue to the wealthiest among us, and doing so stars anti poverty programs because we invest a lot more in subsidizing affluence than alleviating deprivation. And then the country continues to be segregationist. We continue to build walls around our communities and hoard opportunity behind those walls. We need to tear down those walls and we need to start taking responsibility for all the scarcity in our midst. Let's just put this into different buckets if we can, although you make the argument that it's all related. So let's just talk about direct government subsidies, you know, per se. One of the things you point out in the book is that uh, from 1980 to 2017, there was a 237% increase in federal spending on poverty programs. That's not a small amount of, of money. I mean, just in total dollar terms. So why is it that the kind of misery you describe persists given that level of spending? Well, some might say it's because government spending doesn't have a real effect on poverty, but that's just wrong. You know, there's a massive pile of research that shows that government programs directed at our poorest families are incredibly effective, even efficient. They prevent millions of families from plunging into hunger and homelessness every year. But they clearly aren't enough right now. And part of the reason is because we have not fully addressed the unrelenting exploitation of the poor in the labor market, in the housing market, and in the financial market. Let me just give you one quick statistic. Every day, $61 million are pulled out of the pockets of poor families in terms of overdraft fees, check cashing fees, payday loan fees, every single day. 
You know, when James Baldwin wrote how expensive it is to be poor, he couldn't even have imagined those kind of numbers. And so unless we address that exploitation, we're not going to build sturdy, permanent foundation on which we can climb out of poverty for everyone. Well, one of the other points you make, though, is that even with direct federal assistance, that in 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 most places, actually, you say that the majority of that money doesn't actually get directly to people who are under-resourced, that there are only two states where a majority of their assistance under the, the TANF program, which is the main, uh, used to be called welfare, maybe still yeah. is, um, actually goes directly into cash assistance, that most states, it, it goes other places. Where does it go? What, yeah. what does that money do? Yeah, let's break it down. There's kind of two two points that I think are important here. One point is that a dollar in the federal budget doesn't mean a dollar in a family's pocket. So you take this program called TANF, or cash welfare. Uh, for every dollar budgeted for TANF, only 22 cents ends up with a family in terms of direct aid. Why? Well, because states get a lot of leeway about how they spend their money, and they're really creative about how to do it. You know, states have used that money to spend on Christian summer camps or abstinence-only classes, marriage initiatives, things like that. Many of these things don't have anything to do with reducing poverty. Other states just simply sit on the money. You know, Tennessee, last time I checked, was sitting on over $700 million in unspent welfare funds. Hawaii was sitting on enough to give every poor kid in its state $10,000. So that's one thing that's going on. And the second thing that's going on that's important is that a lot of poor families don't take advantage of programs that they need and deserve. We hear a lot about welfare dependency, but if you look at the data, the bigger problem is welfare avoidance. The fact that families are leaving billions and billions of dollars on the table every year. You know, one in five elderly Americans, for example, who could qualify and receive food stamps, they don't take advantage of that. Why, why is that? Is it just too hard? That It's actually just the actual process of getting these benefits is just too hard? Or, or, or why don't people get it? Or because there's a stigma attached to it? Or because yeah. we make it humiliating for people to get it? What, why, why is it that people don't get the benefits that they actually are entitled to? Yeah, all that is part of it. And we used to think stigma was the biggest reason why folks weren't relying on these programs. But it seems a much bigger reason is that we've made them unnecessarily hard and complicated. We've wrapped these programs and red tape and regulations, and we may make it incredibly confusing. This is also very hopeful though. You know, there are studies that show that just like increasing the font or connecting mm. people with someone on the phone can actually bring a lot more benefits to families that, that need them today. You know, one exception to that, of course, was during the COVID crisis when the government made an effort, the federal government made aggressive efforts to kind of get money to people directly. And of course, there was there was a lot of debate and grinching about that. I mean, some there were some people who said, oh, my gosh, you know, it's it's you're, we're paying people not to work. But just in that time period in which the federal government was supporting, was offering additional cash assistance to people because of the covid crisis, did that make a difference in alleviating poverty for some people? Made a huge difference, historic difference. We were able to reduce child poverty by 46 percent in six months six months. How? We expanded the child tax credit, which was just basically a check mailed to families with moderate and low incomes, cut child poverty almost in half. We reduced evictions to historic lows months and months and months after the eviction moratorium ended. Renters finally got a breath and were able to stay in their home and not face homelessness during the pandemic. And it didn't seem to cost jobs. You know, when some states got rid of those extra benefits early and other states didn't, the states that got rid of the benefits, they didn't see their job numbers jump up. Job growth was basically tied between states that kept some of the benefits and those that didn't. So we made these historic, incredible investments in reducing poverty. I would like that to become the new normal. And let's talk about sort of non-cash, the kind of non-cash, non-direct government um, you know, assistance or lack thereof. Talk about the ways in which you feel like these income subsidies redound to the benefit of the middle class and the upper class, upper middle class, and not necessarily to the poor. Talk a little bit about that, if you would. Give one or two examples. Sure. When we think about the welfare state, we usually think about 
cash welfare, public housing, things like that. But we should we should also think so, about things like the mortgage interest deduction, uh, the 529 savings plan, uh, cash break, uh, excuse me, tax breaks we get for wealth transfers in America. That's also part of the welfare state. You know, both a uh, tax break and a government check cost the government money, and both of those put put income in someone's pocket. And so if you add up all the benefits that the government is doling out, social insurance, tax breaks, means-tested programs for the poorest families, you learn that every year in America, the top 20% of us receive about $36,000 from the government, and the bottom 20% receive only $25,000 from the government. That's almost a 40% difference. We're doing a lot more to guard fortunes than we are to expand opportunity. What role do you think race plays in this? Because one of the things I, I noticed about the book is that you know race is a part of it, but race isn't all of it. But I am interested in whether you think that there's an interplay between the way we think about race, the way we act on race in this country, and the way these systems persist. Yeah, absolutely there is. It's impossible to write a book about poverty in the United States with also, without also writing a book about, about race and racism in the United States. A big way race, a big role race plays in the story is, is segregation. You know, uh, white Americans, and especially white affluent Americans, continue to be the most segregated group in the country. You know, uh, we've built these communities where basically the only folks that can live in the communities are, are affluent homeowners, the majority of whom are white in this country. And so thinking about an end of poverty is also thinking about how to tear down those walls and embrace kind of open, more inclusive communities. And so race plays a huge role there. It also plays a huge role into like how people see and understand the poor. There's a lot of really discouraging studies that show that folks are more likely to vote yes on an anti-poverty program uh, if they think the benefit isn't going to uh, African-American families. That's really discouraging. And so I think that the country's legacy of racism and the country's legacy of economic exploitation have gone hand in hand since the founding. Your book has been incredibly well received. I've been really interested in that. I'm curious what you make of it. I think the country is ready for this conversation. I think there's so many of us that are fed up with the old tropes and the old stories of poverty and bootstrapping and responsibility. And I think that we want a more fair society. I think many of us who are not poor, many of us who are privileged, feel complicit in all this poverty around us. And it drags us all down. And so many of us are struggling, also want a language and a new story about why it's so hard to get ahead in the land of the free. So I, I don't know, I, I think that there's, you know, this is a, a driving issue of our day. This is a morally urgent issue that many Americans uh, want to have this conversation. Yeah. You did not grow up wealthy. In fact, you talk about it very openly in the book, and I think very movingly. You've experienced your parents losing their job. You've experienced losing your home because of it. You've experienced having to work really hard to get through school, not having the, all the choices that you wanted to make. How do you understand your own story in the context of all this? I was given opportunities from the government. I was given things like student loans. And we often don't think about a student loan as a government program, but it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I was given uh, tuition remission at my state university. That helped a lot. Um, and I think that I was able to recognize the way that the government intervened in my life in ways that really did result in social climbing. And I want a government that does more of that for everyone. I want a government that is truly obsessively committed to ending poverty because I think that's a government that's obsessively committed to freedom and happiness and equal opportunity. And so if that means that I need to give up a few things that I now receive because of, you know, I'm a member of the professional class, that's totally a bargain I'm willing to make. So for example, you know, could it be the case that homeowners who get this big benefit from the government, the mortgage interest deduction, start really thinking about that? You know, in 2020, we as a nation spent $190 billion on homeowner subsidies, but only $53 billion on direct housing assistance to the needy. 
In a, in a world where eviction is commonplace, in a world where most renting families spend at least half of what they have on housing costs, that seems to be out of lock with our values and our priorities. I'd like to bring that more into balance. Professor Matthew Desmond, thanks so much for talking with us today. Thanks, Michelle. Always a pleasure and privilege. A lot of substance in that, but I, uh, um, it's very hard for me to watch because I, because I see um, so much in this country where, and, and I'll start right with, people are not applying for benefits that they have, they have rights to, even access to, because the paperwork is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. and because they don't know about it or and because they can't get assistance and I have applied for assistance and you never just get one application in they call and they want more or they send you a letter or they send you two letters and, and they want more and, and if you're poor and you moved you don't get that letter you don't get the letters that's right and if you're threatened with eviction or evicted then then you're cut out of housing and the next place, and you're, you're, the retaliation is huge. I mean, there's so much to this. We might have to have another show just yeah. to continue the conversation I on this. I think so. I think it's good that, that he wrote a book, but then... Who's going to read the book? Certainly not the poor. Yeah. Because they, don't, I, they may not be able to afford it or they don't have the time. So mm -hmm. I think he thinks that the book is a wake-up call to those who do have the time. He's trying to raise awareness, trying to dent through but our we've blinders. Known since, you know, the 60s and 70s about the poverty. It Ooh. hasn't changed. No, it's it, gotten it worse. Not. No, it's going to get, and it's it definitely going Definitely has to. gotten worse. Yeah. How do you <laughs> feel about it? Well, I, I really, you know, I think that we should be striving for the elimination of poverty, and if we mm -hmm. do that, we will mm -hmm. have a, a stronger nation. I've heard some people say it's like you have an economic system, and it's, it's, it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, if I do good, you do bad. If everybody does better, everybody does, does better. better. You know, it? having those people locked out of our economic system is causing our system to rot. Mm -hmm. they, that, they, would, they wouldn't take that money and send it to the Cayman Islands. They, no. would, they would spend it in our community. They would build our economy. Mm -hmm. It's not taking away. It's giving, too. You know, so it's just raising people out of poverty would raise the entire country up economically. But you have to deal with race and discrimination. And discrimination, I have to use myself as an example, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. But the, the terrible salaries, the five, ten times more that other people were making that I was working, also put me, part of what put me in becoming we're just down impoverished. About 20 seconds though. Yeah. yeah. And so we have to continue this conversation. Yes, we're going to have to talk some more. You bet. I definitely. But I think we needed to show that whole video because otherwise you, yep. don't, you gave don't get the whole that picture. So we'll do a part 2 maybe? Yes, let's do a part 2 <laughs> we next week. We can do a part 2 and next connect week. all the dots on yes. housing and power. Yes. yes. Sounds good Thank to me. Thank you. So power to the people and we'll see you next week. Power to the people. Thank you.